So if there's been a theme that the stock market of 2022 has followed thus far, it would be basically everything is going down except for companies that sell oil and basic utilities, along with some other miscellaneous sectors like some insurance companies, fertilizers, and maybe a few others. So on screen here, you can see the two best performing sectors year to date in 2022 is energy is number one by a pretty significant margin and utilities would be number two going up at about 3% uh, on the year, but pretty much everything else has gone down. And if we click further into energy, we can see the actual sectors that are performing the best. And we can see oil and gas production has gone up a pretty decent amount, 11%. The coal mining industry is up 40% year to date. Oil well services and equipment, 35%. So if you've been invested in energy, you've probably done pretty well in the face of essentially everything else in 2022, not doing nearly as well. Now, I've had a couple of people reach out to me and ask what I'm doing amidst all of this market craziness. You know, what's my strategy? Why aren't I making 30 videos per day talking about this market crash and inflation and interest rates and all this type of stuff? And the truth is, I'm not really doing anything personally, at least not doing anything different than what I would normally do. And the reason for that is because I don't really find I ever learn anything from reading financial news or keeping up with what's going up uh, in the markets on a day-to-day -day basis, just because I find that it can overwhelm me pretty easily and it can confuse me even more than if I try to learn about what's actually going on. And my focus is always really just going to be on understanding businesses that I'm already interested in learning about and potentially investing in, and then essentially just waiting for them to hit the prices that I'd be comfortable uh, purchasing them at. So that's what I do a lot on this channel, right? You guys see me do a lot of valuations and I talk about not just the company's financials, but also the sectors in which they operate and kind of what's going on in the market in terms of long-term trends in their specific sectors. Because if you're going to stay invested in a company, the way you're going to make your money presumably is by holding them into the long term, right? You're not just going to hold the company for one to two years, unless you're a swing trader, which is something different. If you consider yourself a value investor, you're holding them with the intention of holding them for a long period of time. So what's going on in the market, you know, in the next one to two years or what's going on with interest rates and inflation, absolutely, it will impact your investment and you do have to consider it, but it's not something you need to keep up with on a day-to-day -day basis, in my opinion. And it, it can really just kind of lead you to make irrational decisions, watching the market on a day-to-day -day basis, and personally, I don't even watch news a whole lot. I try and stay away from news because again, it really just distracts me and I'd rather just stay focused on you know, what I'm personally interested in investing in. So in terms of what's going on in the market, really not doing anything different than what I'd normally be doing. Now, despite all of what I just talked about, the company that we're gonna be looking at today is Canadian Natural Resources. So this is probably one of the largest Canadian companies that I haven't yet covered on this channel. And I do want to cover it because it is a bit of an interesting case study about a company that has performed extremely well in the face of a market downturn. And we all know why that is. We'll get into why that is later. But we can see in the last year, the company has almost doubled in price, which is pretty significant considering the market as a whole is down, what, 15, 10, 12, 20, maybe even 20 percent at this point. And this company has done extremely well. So if you're investing in this company, congratulations, you're probably pretty happy. But I do want to look at what's unique about this company that led it to perform so well in the year 2022. And if it still represents good value at its current price, at how, considering how much it's gone up recently, is there still value to be had here? So that's what we'll get into in this video. So a quick overview of who this company is and what they do. Uh, so they're essentially an oil and gas exploration and production company, and they're primarily an upstream oil and gas company. However, they do have some midstream operations as they do operate two pipelines. And currently they're valued at about $86 billion in Canadian dollars. And they do report their financials in Canadian dollars. So all the numbers you see me use here is gonna be in Canadian dollars for this video. Now, unless you live under a rock, I'm sure you're probably aware that oil prices have gone up a lot recently. So I'm gonna pull up the chart here and we can see exactly how much oil prices have gone up by year over year. And you know, if you own a car, you're probably have seen a lot higher gas prices, which is somewhat linked to the price of oil. So if we go back say uh, to July, so this is of 2021, we can see Pretty much sort of around this area so in early march oil spiked up a lot and it's currently at about 110 dollars per barrel which looking at it on a historical basis is extremely high for example if you look at what oil prices have been in the last 25 years 
we can see here that it is historically quite high and it was down low for a pretty extended period kind of in the mid 2000s and then obviously what's going on in the world geopolitically right now has led to a very sharp rise. Now, Canadian Natural sells both crude oil and natural gas, and it's important to note that the prices of these two commodities are somewhat correlated because the way of the supply and the demand works, they're pretty similar because these products are generally seen as substitutes for one another and the production dynamics work a kind of the same. As we can see in this chart here that maps the prices of them, we can see up until 2000, mid 2008 really, the prices were pretty correlated. We can see they tend to go up and down with each other, but then around mid 2008, something happened where that essentially completely reversed and they actually were inversely correlated to one another somewhat where we can see if one goes up, for example, if crude oil goes up, then natural gas would go down in this case. So why is that? Now, the reason this kind of happened, um, there's well, there's many reasons really. The big one is the rise of shale oil production through hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. So fracking increased the supply of natural gas very significantly when it became more widespread. And because natural gas is a bit more of a local market where it's mainly sold, it's produced in North America and sold in North America, whereas oil is a much more global market where global supply and demand factors come into play. Because fracking increased the supply of local natural gas much more than it did for, say, crude oil, it kind of led to this, um, the correlation being broken a little bit. Because when supply increases, if demand stays the same, then price will fall down, obviously. So that's kind of a simplified version. There's really many reasons you could look at as to why this phenomenon has taken place, but that is one of the more, what I would consider the more obvious reasons why we see it happen. Okay, so now let's take a look at this company's past financial statements to see what we can learn. Now, what I wanna do in this part of the video is take a look at their past financials to understand the business and also understand how management allocates capital, right? And then from there, we can take a step back and look more at the macro view of oil and gas, and then tie that into the company's future to see how much free cash flow they can earn in the future years, and then obviously distribute that free cash flow to shareholders. Because that's really what we're interested in as owners of this business, right? If you believe that a business is just the sum of the present value of all its future cash flows, then that's really how you should value companies. That's how I personally value companies. So that's what we're going to try and determine here. Now, what we're going to see when we look at this, and we can see it right off of the income statement, is that this company is quite volatile in terms of how much money they earn. So if we just start by looking revenue and look at the year over year changes, we can see pretty significant fluctuations year over year. And we obviously know why that is. This is gonna be correlated to the price of oil and gas because the, this company, they aren't big enough where the amount of production they have is gonna influence the price of oil, right? There's way too much oil in the world being produced that this company is gonna affect the supply and demand of that at least not to an extent that it'll impact the price. So they're kind of a, just a victim to whatever countries decide to do, whatever OPEC decides to do in terms of raising production, limiting production, which then has an impact on prices. But uh, there are some demand factors that come into play. Like we can see uh, in 2020, they had a pretty abysmal year. I mean, only about 17 billion in revenue compared to 2021 when they had the 30 billion. Big reason for that was because of just the lack of demand, right? There was just a significant decrease in demand for oil, especially in early 2020. And we all know why that is because of that thing that happened in 2020. And then this has an impact all throughout the company's financials. We can see they even had negative operating income in 2020. Contrast that with 2021 when they had almost 10 billion in operating income. So if you're going to invest in this company, you better be able to stomach some large fluctuations and you better have a pretty solid long-term view on oil specifically and have a strong thesis that you truly believe in because otherwise um, buying into an $86 billion company that loses money, it's not going to be good. But anyways, we can move on to this. We can see net income. So net income was $7.6 billion. So very strong. That's record profits for them. And big reason why that is, is obviously what we've seen with oil. And this company has been increasing their production. So if with a company like this, they can increase their revenue if they, number one, increase their production, and number two, if the price of oil just goes up. So we saw both of that happen in 2021 here. Now, I also like to look at valuation metrics. So because we just looked at earnings, let's look at 
the PE ratio and just see how this has kind of evolved over time. Now it's probably gonna flow. Yeah, we can see here, it goes up and down a lot, just depending on if the company makes money versus loses money. So, but if we look at where it's currently at, only at about under 10 times price to diluted EPS, which is pretty similar to basic EPS. So, I mean, that's still, that, that might strike some of you as a pretty low multiple, but to me, there still is a bit of growth priced into a 10 price to earnings ratio. So I do think that if you're buying at this company at its current valuation, you're essentially expecting last year to continue into the future. So oil prices to stay high, their production to keep increasing because with a company like this, we know a company like this has a limited shelf life, right? It's an oil company. Oil isn't going to be around forever. It is probably going to be around for many decades into the future, but it's not going to be around forever, right? So this is a company that I would consider to be in secular decline just because of the general shift we're seeing in uh, in energy usage, you know, the move towards renewables, even though oil and gas obviously still very much dominates how we get our energy in today's world and probably will stay that way for at least I would say the next two decades, but you can't deny that that shift is going to occur at some point. Now, another note on this PE ratio, I would expect this PE ratio to decline a bit further when they report their Q2 earnings for 2022. And the reason for this is because if we look at kind of the monthly oil prices reported here, so Q1 of 2022 would have just been January, February, and March. And we can see oil only hit $100 a barrel in the last month of that, so in March. So for most of their Q1, which again, they reported record profits, very strong cash flow, oil wasn't even in the $100 a barrel range. And it has been in the $100 barrel range for a while now. So when they report their Q2, you're probably going to see extremely strong earnings, which that's obviously already going to be priced in at this level. Um, but when that happens, the PE ratio, I would imagine, would go down because to some extent that is going to be priced in here. Now, what I also want to look at is the price to book value per share. So this kind of tells you what investors are expecting you know, the company to earn in relation to their book value. Now, book value consists of obviously the equipment that this company has that they use to extract the oil, so the oil rigs and whatnot, but also their reserves are going to be valued. They're called, I believe, exploration and uh, extrapolation assets, something like that, but they're valued on their balance sheet. It's really just an accounting estimate. It's not going to be perfect. Um, and it's about usually a few billion dollars on this company's balance sheet. So kind of small in relation to um, the equipment side. But still, let's take a look at what this ratio has looked like over an extended period of time. So if this ratio is higher, then people are more optimistic about the future of the company. So it's extremely high right now, right? At about 2.3 times. And if we look back not too long ago, it was in March of 2020, it was only 0.38. So, and there's a good reason for that, right? There was a lot of fear baked in at that price, but very strong expansion of the multiple here, which signals a complete shift in investor sentiment, which is driven by the price increase we've seen in oil, which benefits a company like this. But historically, it's extremely high. But just because it's high doesn't mean we should disqualify it as an investment because there could be a good reason for its high and it may still do very well. So that's kind of what I want to do uh, in the next part of the video. But before I get into that, let's just quickly take a look at the cash flow because like I said, we want to understand how this company allocates capital, right? So their earning record cash flows, you can see 14 and a half billion in 2022. How do they use it? Well, four and a half billion went to capital expenditures, which is pretty in line with what we've seen historically. So. Some of that is probably growth CapEx, where they're investing in CapEx that will actually help the company increase its production into the future. But most of it would probably be maintenance CapEx, which is capital expenditures that they have to pay just to maintain their assets in a state where they can you know, continue to operate and earn the company money. So, so about they still have about $10 billion uh, in cash flow left over after that. So how did they use it? Well, we can see a lot went to debt repayment. Seven billion of that actually went to debt repayment. Now, I did look it up. Their interest rate on their debt is about 4%, between three and a half and 4%, which is if a pretty low interest rate. So this company is not seen as super risky by the people who do debt rating. Now, 
you may be asking why would they use, if they have all this cash flow, why would they use it to pay down debt if their interest rate's only 4%? Because if you look at it from a capital allocation standpoint, you're essentially saying that at 4%, you know, there's no other opportunities that the company can foresee out there that would earn them a rate of return of higher than 4%. Because if they're paying 4% debt, they're basically saving that 4% interest cost into the distant future. And it would be better if they could invest in, say, new production that they could then earn 15, 20% return on that. That would be much better for shareholders. Um, but if we look at the balance sheet, we can see their long-term debt went from 20 billion down to about 13.5 billion. So this kind of, it de-risks the company, which for a company like this is probably what they're going to be more interested in, taking a more reserved approach to capital allocation rather than a more aggressive one, which would be them investing in new production because they don't know what the price of oil will be in the future, right? It's extremely high now, but they obviously have an idea based on, because they're industry experts, but they can't foresee what oil prices will be five years down the line, right? So doing this move by paying down all this debt, it essentially de-risks the company. It deleverages the company and makes it much less susceptible to facing financial trouble into the future, which I think if you're a shareholder, I would appreciate that a lot. You know, maybe there was a way they could deploy their capital to earn a higher rate of return, but you have to keep in mind just the uncertainty of the industry they're in. And because if they were to invest in, say, a new oil rig, and then something happens that they couldn't foresee, oil prices crash, and say their break-even point on that oil rig is they need, to be, they need oil to be, say, in the $50, $60 per barrel range, and it's not that, then they basically have a money-losing asset, and they've destroyed shareholder value. Whereas what they did here, if the debt repayment is a surefire way to make the company more valuable, deleverage it, de-risk it, and overall just help shareholders. So... Even though it may not be the best allocation of capital, I still do think it is, it, it's a move that makes sense in my opinion. So, and then we can also see they increase their dividend. I believe recently they announced they're increasing their dividend by 25, 28%. So that makes a lot of sense. Now, because they're probably gonna earn even more record cash flows in this year, if oil prices stay where they're at, then what are they gonna do with that cash, right? They've already paid down a ton of debt. Um, they could increase their dividend further, but what I think they would do would be to buy back a ton of shares because again, that locks in value, right? Especially if they believe that the shares are undervalued, right? Which that's a whole other question and topic for another video. But if we look at their shares outstanding, it has actually increased in the last few years. So they haven't been able to reduce it. Well, they're able to reduce it here. So we can see it increased up to this point and then they started to buy back some shares. So currently I have about 1.18 billion shares outstanding. So they could do a very significant buyback program because a company like this, they're probably not going to use a ton of cash to invest in production. They will use some of it, but not a ton uh, just because it is a more mature industry. And because of the uncertainty with oil prices, that investment may not actually end up paying off. So personally, I would say if oil stays at $100 a barrel, the company earns even more record cash flows. A lot of it, I would imagine, go to dividends, some to debt, and then some to share buybacks. Okay, so that's a review of past financials. Now let's try and pull out our crystal ball and look into the future a little bit. And let's focus on the macro view of oil. Now, obviously, as we've already established, oil is very volatile. So predicting what oil prices will be into the future is really a futile effort because you could spend hours upon hours with all the resources in the world, all the smartest people in the world with all the knowledge of oil in the world and something could happen that just completely throws all of your projections off and it ends up being wrong. So I did find, so this is a report here from the US Energy Information Administration. So they provide some guidance on what they'd expect. So I'll zoom in so you can see it. So WTI, so crude oil, the US benchmark of crude oil, they projected it will average $112 per barrel in the second quarter of 2022. So if we take a look back here at kind of what it did more recently, um, it hit 112 in March, but it, in these months here, so in Q1 of 2022, it was still below $100 a barrel. So if oil can stay, at, if this is correct and it stays at $112 per barrel for all the second quarter of 2022, that's going to be a record year for Canadian natural resource, Canadian natural resources. So I don't really want to look any further into the future other than that. And even a projection like this is 
probably going to be wrong. Um, and it's just a short-term forecast. And the more in the future you go, the more difficult it becomes because of all the different types of things that could happen. So instead, what I want to do is basically take a look at certain scenarios of oil prices and then see how um, under certain future scenarios of oil prices, what sort of cash flows could we expect to see this company earn? So what I've done here is I've taken the, the quarters for the past three years, taken the average oil price for those quarters, and then looked at what the company's earnings were in relation to that oil price. And then we can learn a few key things about the company. So we can see here when oil prices initially fell off a cliff kind of in early 2020, the company lost money. So oil averaged about uh, $50 a barrel here. They lost about $1.5 billion. And then oil kept falling and they didn't lose as much money in the second quarter of 2020 when oil went down even further to about $30 a barrel. Um, and that was mainly because they were able to cut back on their production costs a lot and save some money. They weren't really able to do that here because that sudden decrease in oil prices probably caught them off guard and they couldn't really take the cost cutting measures necessary. And then oil recovered a bit and they went back to earning a profit of about 400 million in Q3 of 2020. So from this, we can learn that break even for this company is really probably in the range of third, high 30s, low $40 per barrel. So that's what they need oil to be at, at least for them to not lose money, essentially. And obviously, if oil is higher, the higher oil goes, the more profits they earn. And we can see that taking place as the future quarters progressed. And we can see as oil kept rising, they kept earning more money. And then when oil was averaged at about $96 per barrel in Q1 of 2022, they earned over $4 billion in profits just for that one quarter. So if oil stays much higher, for example, at around $110 per barrel for Q2 of 2022, they could do pretty well. So what we can learn from this is Number one, break even is around $40 per barrel, and the higher oil goes, it's not exactly a perfect one to one correlation, right? If oil prices increase, say 10% from where they are at, say this point here, where they go from 78 to 96, their profits will increase by a much higher rate. And that's just kind of how the economics work with, you know, economies of scale and whatnot. So we can kind of, we can look at this relationship here. And we can kind of decipher, okay, what if oil stays at about uh, $100 per barrel? How much free cash flow will they earn over the next three years? So I just did three years, 2022, 2023, 2024. I estimated what their capital expenditures would be for those periods. So 2022, I actually took this CapEx figure directly from the company's guidance. Um, and then for these years, I kind of just gave a general estimate based off of historical uh, historical figures for CapEx. So cash flow from operations, this is what I'm looking at here. Whereas here I was looking at earnings. Earnings were a bit more stable when you're trying to, I guess, correlate them to the oil price, because if you tried to co correlate oil price to cash flow, that could really get thrown off if the company makes a large working capital investment in one quarter. So it's not going to be as smooth of a relationship. But I do, you can learn from looking at this company's financials that cash from operations is generally going to be much higher than earnings. And that's just because of the very high depreciation amortization costs they have, right? Because they have a large amount of fixed assets. So they have to charge depreciation on that. But since that's a non cash expense, it will reduce earnings, but it won't reduce cash from operations. So if oil stays at about $100 per barrel and you know, their earnings are this kind of pattern we're seeing here of earnings to oil prices kind of stays basically what we'd expect it to be. And I've applied 1.25 times multiple of earnings to cash flow because, like I said, cash flow is going to be higher. And then we do it for a full year. It uh, to me, it, it seems reasonable that the company could earn over $20 billion in, in uh, cash flow and maybe even $18 billion in free cash flow for 2022, which that may come as a surprise. It may come as a shock because that seems extremely high for this company. But I mean, oil is very high, right? And if it stays at that level, it's to me, it seems reasonable to assume that, that could take place. And if oil stays at $100 per barrel for 2023 and 2024, which again, that's a huge assumption. We don't know if that will happen. But if we assume it does, the company could earn 
close to 55 billion in free cash flow just in the next five years. So they could earn over half of their current market cap just in the next three years if oil stays at that price, which is, that would make for a great investment, right? Because if you look at a market cap really just as a sum of the future cash flows that a company will earn and then distribute to its shareholders discounted to the present, which that is what the market cap is, right? That's kind of the basic theory of valuation. Then you'd kind of want to project how much cash flow they could earn in the future years and then compare that to their current market cap. So if the company can earn over half of their current market cap just in the next three years of operations, then that's going to make for a tremendous investment. Right. And I know I didn't do a full DCF and actually precisely measure how, what the return would be if, if that does happen, which I try to do normally on this channel. I kind of just in this one to get a general idea of what it might be. Um, but from that alone, you can decipher that it would be a great investment. But let's say, I mean, $100 per barrel in oil for the next three years. It's a bit of assumption. Let's say it only averages 80 you can see free cash flow goes down quite significantly. Now we're only looking at about $30.5 billion in free cash flow. So that's a much lower, you know, that decreased by what, 23, 24 billion. So you can see the price relationship between cash flow to oil is pretty strong. And even if it went down even more to say 60, then this figure gets even worse. So you, this, the reason I'm doing this is to illustrate how much your investment in this company depends on the price of oil. Now, obviously they do also sell natural gas, but I just kind of looked at oil here because um, the vast majority, about 90% of their product sales are coming from crude oil. We can see here 29 billion versus only 2.7 billion coming from natural gas. So for the most part, oil is gonna be the main thing that drives your investment here. So anyways, guys, that pretty much does it for me for this video. I wanted to do another oil and gas company analysis. So I hope you did enjoy this one and you found it useful. Uh, if you did, then please leave a like. And if you have some interesting thoughts to share about anything related to this company or oil and gas industry in general, please leave a comment. You know, I love hearing from you guys. You guys are really smart and you have some interesting opinions. So please feel free to share any insight you have. And yeah, that pretty much does it for this video. So thank you so much for sticking around and listening and I'll see you in the next video.